Hi, I'm Justin from My Mortgage Trainer, and we're going to go over how to succeed when you're taking the NMLS MLO exam. Today, we're going to be covering a topic that I see many students struggle with in their Safe 20 pre-licensed education, and that's mortgage math. More specifically, calculating debt to income ratios. Now make sure you stick around to the end of the video for some more uh, tips for your test taking success. In the mortgage world, there are two debt ratios a borrower needs to meet when we're assessing their ability to repay a loan. Uh, these are the housing ratio or the front end ratio and the total debt ratio also known as the back end ratio. These ratios are going to be written something like this. It should show 3143 there. In this example, this would mean the housing payment can be no more than 31% of the borrower's gross monthly income. And then when included with their other debts, the total debt cannot be over 43% of their monthly income. To calculate a housing ratio, we're going to take the borrower's proposed housing payments, whatever they're going to have on the house that they're trying to buy uh, or refinance. We're going to divide that by the borrower's gross monthly income. Remember, the housing payment is going to be made up of the principal, the interest, the taxes, and any insurances required on that property. If the home has a homeowners association, uh, those dues are going to be included in that front end ratio as well. For the total debt ratio, this is going to include all of the debt that's on a borrower's credit report. Uh, the housing payment, any payments for alimony, child support, or any ongoing tax obligations. Once we have all those added all together, uh, we're going to divide those by the gross monthly income and that's going to give us that back end or total debt ratio. Now, there are some rules to remember to ensure that we're calculating this properly. So first, items like utility bills, car insurance, cell phone bills, borrower's monthly beer budget, those they are not going to be included in either of those ratios. Next, installment debts like a car loan, student loans, personal loans. Anytime we have any of those with less than 10 payments remaining on them, we actually don't have to calculate those in those ratios. And auto lease, these aren't going to be looked at the same way. At the end of your car payment, you've got a car. At the end of an auto lease, you need to buy a car or you need a new lease. So we're always going to have to keep those in, the, or in those ratios. Also, if you're given a revolving account balance rather than a payment on either your test or when you're pulling a credit report, we're going to use 5% of that balance as the monthly payment for that debt. We're always going to calculate these ratios as if the loan is done. If they give you a borrower's current rent payment on a question about a borrower purchasing a primary home, we're not going to add that to either of these ratios because they're no longer going to be renting once that loan closes. And finally, we need to make sure that the borrower meets both the front end and the back end ratio when we're assessing if they qualify. So what we're going to do here is we're going to test your understanding on this topic with a couple of examples. All right, so our first example question. A borrower and a co-borrower apply for a loan. The borrower has an annual salary of $60,000, and the co-borrower makes $12.50 an hour and works 40 hours per week. They currently pay $1,200 in rent, and their debts include a car payment of $583, a credit card balance of $2,000, Will they qualify for an FHA loan with a PITI payment of $2,011, assuming the qualifying ratios of 3143? Our options are A, no, they don't meet either ratio. B, yes, they meet both ratios. C, no, they don't meet the front end ratio. Or D, no, they don't meet the back end ratio. Now, for the sake of keeping this video a little shorter, to prevent a video with me just kind of standing here, I would suggest pausing this video now and working on this at your own uh, pace. Uh, once you have your answer, you can resume the video and we'll go from there. Okay, so let's go over that. The borrower makes $60,000 per year. When you divide that by 12, you're going to get their gross monthly income of $5,000. For the co-borrower, we'll take their hourly pay rate of $12.50 an hour we're going to multiply that by 40 hours per week. Uh, multiply that number by 52, <clears throat> we're going to get their yearly income of $26,000. Divide that by 12, we're going to have $2,166.67. Of course, then we're going to add the borrower and the co-borrower's income together to get their gross monthly income of $7,166.67.
Now for the front end ratio, again, we're going to take that proposed housing payment of $2,011. We're going to divide it by their total monthly income of $7,166.67. So that's going to put our front end ratio at 28.06%. For the back end ratio, we're going to add that proposed housing payment to the total debt of $583 for the car payment and $100 for 5% of that $2,000 credit card balance. It's going to put their total debt at $2,694. When we divide that by that monthly income that they have, that's going to give us a back end ratio of 37.59%. With their total debt ratios at 28.06 and 37.59%, they are going to meet both ratios for that FHA loan, so the correct answer is going to be B. They meet both ratios. All right, second example we have. Here, we have a borrower with a monthly salary of $4,580. They're applying for a conventional conforming mortgage with a PITI payment of $1,126. Their current debts are a $450 lease payment that they have four months left on a credit card payment of $55, and a student loan payment of $235. Will this borrower qualify for the conforming conventional loan with qualifying ratios of 28-36? Options there are going to be the same. A, they don't meet either ratio. B, they meet both ratios. C, they do not meet the front-end ratio. Or D, D, they do not meet the back-end ratio. Once again, I want to suggest that you pause here just to work out the answer on your own and hit resume whenever you're ready. Now here, we already have our gross monthly income of $4,580. With this, we can make sure the loan does not exceed that front end ratio by multiplying their income by 0.28 or 28%. That'll give us the max front end debt the borrower could have if they have no other liabilities. So when we do that, that's gonna give us a maximum payment of $1,282.40. As long as our PI does not exceed $1,282.40, we know that they're gonna meet that front end ratio. For the back end ratio, we're gonna add up all of the borrower's monthly liabilities. In this case, we have the PITI of $1,126, the lease payment of $450, the credit card payment of $55, and their student loans of $235 per month. That's gonna give us a total debt of $1,866. To meet that back end ratio, we need the total debts to be under 36% of their income, uh, or $1,648.80 if you already did the math. Since their total debt is above this, they're not going to meet the back-end ratio guideline, making the answer D. And remember, guys, we are not able to exclude lease payments from the debts, no matter how few payments they have left. All right, for our third example, here we have Douglas, who earns $28.76 an hour and works 40 hours per week. The borrower has applied for a 30-year mortgage of $234,000 at 3.75% with a PITI payment of $1,541.39. His taxes are $292.50 and his homeowner's insurance is $95 per month. The borrower has a car payment of $518 and a revolving credit card payment of $51. What is Douglas's front end and back end ratio? Again, here's your chance to pause the video and finish this on your own. All right, so let's work that one out. So the income is going to calculate at $28.76 an hour times 40 hours per week times 52 weeks in a year. Divide that by 12 and we're going to get the gross monthly income of $4,985.07. The PITI payment of $1,541.39 is given in this question. Now when we divide that by his income of $4,985.07, we're going to get a front end ratio of 30.92. Now, this is a great example of the ways they may try to trick you in the test. The PITI payment they gave 
will already include those taxes and homeowners insurance. But they're given on the question just to throw you off. For the back end ratio, we'll again add up all the borrower's debts to get a total of $2,110.39. When we divide this by his income, we're going to get a back end ratio of 42.33%. So how did you do on this? I hope this makes you feel a little bit more comfortable with the mortgage origination math that's going to be required on your SAFE 20 NMLS pre-license exam. And finally, I promised a few tips to help you pass the test. Since this video is about math, we're going to kind of start right there. When you have a math question, make sure you do that math twice just to be sure that you get the same answer. The test is going to be multiple choice, so of course, if you don't get an answer that's on the test, you likely did it wrong. Also, since the test is all multiple choice, it can be helpful to try to answer the question in your head before reading those available answers. This will keep your brain active and may even keep you from second guessing your answer once you've read the answers that they give you. To check out some of our other videos on test prep and more, as well as make sure that you don't miss any of our new videos, make sure you click the like and subscribe button below and check out some of the videos that are probably showing up in this end screen right now.